time C. Um, oops, maybe I shouldn't put that there. I should put the C at the low. Okay, so it's a it's a function that's zero everywhere, and then one from time uh, value of t equals c onwards. All right, so um, the unit step, what it allows us to do is on its own, it's just um, a function that takes in either zero and one, but when we start multiplying functions to the unit step, then we can think of it as an activation or deactivation of a function. All right, the Dirac delta is quite similar, and um, I forgot who, who was it that asked the question just now. Um, but basically, it is a unit impulse that is applied instantaneously. So I want to think about the Dirac Delta as something that's zero everywhere, except for a single moment in time where it takes on the value of infinite, infinity. Um, why is that infinity? We want the area under the curve at that time to be equal to one. So in this case, if my, I set my Dirac Delta to be at zero, then it's zero everywhere. And then a pulse, a unit force or a unit impulse at, time, at a given time. Okay. Yeah. I'm um, sorry. Um, so it's like from one, it slowly increases to infinity. Um, what do you mean? Uh, you were saying that the height part has to. So yeah. So originally, the height is. Um, if we're taking time to epsilon, the original height is one over epsilon. Right, and then if we take epsilon smaller, the height is going to be slightly big. This one over epsilon is bigger. We keep on decreasing that epsilon, that time interval, until we just have a peak at time zero in this case, or we can now move it wherever you want. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, oh, awesome. So five important theorems on the Laplace transform. First, the Laplace transform is a linear operator. That means if I have an addition of two functions, I can just add their Laplace transforms. Um, please note that you cannot multiply Laplace transform. Okay, the Laplace transform of f times g in general is not equal to the Laplace transform of f times the Laplace transform of g. Please do not, never, 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 never do that. And we have the shifting theorems for that if you need multiplication. Okay, so the only time Laplace transform sort of distributes nicely is over addition. Next, um, we derive using integration by parts the Laplace transform of a derivative in class, right? And the idea is if I'm looking at a derivative of a function, its Laplace transform is just decreasing powers of s and increasing derivatives of the function f evaluated at zero, and then we just subtract them all from each other. Okay, so maybe um, s has decreasing powers and f has evaluated zero has increasing derivatives. Laplace transform of integrals, this is just a formula that you are free to use. If I'm integrating a function and taking the Laplace transform of that integral, that's just the same as multiplying one over s to the Laplace transform of the original function. Um, next are your two shifting theorems. Now, I I think just to make the first shifting theorem a little bit clearer, I've rewritten it here. Um, it looks a little bit different from uh, what your notes usually says. I think usually, oh, why is there a one over s here? Oh no, typo. There shouldn't be a one over s there. That should just be um, L of f evaluated at s to the s minus c. Okay, I'm gonna change this. Um, can you just, if y'all can just give me one second and um, because this is important and I don't want y'all to blame me if you accidentally use the wrong formula. Okay, give me one second. Let's see if this works. Let's use the magic of Apple technology. Yes, good, good. So let's replace this page. Scrap that. And then let's add this. Okay, here you go. Does that work? Yes. Okay. So The first shifting theorem states that if I have a product of an exponential, so this is one of the first products that we will now learn how to deal with. If I have a product of an exponential and a function, then its Laplace transform is whatever the Laplace transform of your original function is, where S is now replaced by S minus C. Now, usually, I think previously in your notes, I wrote 
f of s minus c, where f of s is l of f t, right? This is exactly the same. Um, the reason I'm just writing this is because usually when you see f of s minus c, um, it's not obvious what you're trying to calculate first. But if I write it this way, it's obvious that you need to calculate l of f of t first. And then after calculating l of f t, replace s with s minus c. OK, so um, just be very careful with that. Um, the second shifting theorem. So OK, maybe I should say the first shifting theorem is a shift in t. So um, or sorry, a shift in s because it's an exponential in t. So um, the shift only happens after you have computed the Laplace transform, okay, not before. Next is your second shifting theorem, which talks about functions that get activated at a later time. So again, when we see this type of function, ft minus c times ut minus c, it means it's a function that gets shifted forward by c and only turned on at time c. So it's, for example, zero, zero everywhere, and then at time c, it gets activated, right? What does it correspond to in the Laplace world? It's an exponential times the Laplace of your original function at or origin zero. Um, for the Laplace transform of integrals, what is the tau inside equivalent to? It's just a variable that you're integrating with respect to, right? So for example, what is the Laplace transform of zero to t um, sine tau d tau? Then the Laplace transform of this is just one over s times the Laplace transform of sine t. So it's just an example. So tau is just a variable. Okay. Um, okay, so what do we wanna interpret this as? Uh, really the way we wanna interpret this product is that you're shifting the origin to C. Okay, so the origin is moved from zero to, to C, positive C, right? So what happens if instead of starting your function officially at time C, you have your function running in the background, but you only want to take into account um, a time C. Then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to look for what function starts at time C. In this case, the function is f of t plus C. Okay, so again, we're shifting the origin, but if I shift the origin, f of t is no longer the function that starts at that time, so it's going to be f of t plus C. Uh, these two are equivalent, just two different formulations of the second shifting theorem. Any questions about the five key results? We see all of them today and um, the main definitions on the Laplace transform. Um, there aren't a lot of problems today, so we can, go, we can afford to go a little bit more slowly for today's problems. Uh, we'll try our best to see um, if we can treat all of them or treat them to the best of our abilities. Okay, then, so let, let's get this, go ahead and get started. Um, I just added a, a, fun, a fun problem here. Uh, normally I would ask this at the end of class, but I figured since there's some time today, let's add this problem. Uh, based on theorem three, you can Laplace a uh, Laplace. Ah, uh, in a way, yes, except that here, this function should only depend on tau, right? So it's gonna be a bit weird to have this function also depend on S. And then you're Laplacing a function in S. So you're Laplacing, so technically it's fine, but it's like a double layer Laplace, which sort of doesn't, doesn't feel as important. Yeah, so S would be held constant, exactly. It's just that you're Laplacing a function. So what you're trying to say is, can I Laplace a function of S? This doesn't really make sense because what are we converting it to? Are we converting everything towards S again or, or what, right? So this doesn't really make too much sense, at least to me, yeah. Okay, but yes, technically speaking, you can Laplace an integral, yes. All right, fun problem for today. And this should ideally help you guys out if you see a weird product and you don't have it on your list. If f of s is the Laplace transform of some function f of t, show that the Laplace transform of the product t times f of t, right? We told you guys earlier that if I have the Laplace of f times g, this is not equal to the Laplace of f times the Laplace of g, right? Do not do this. But in this case, I'm saying that if I have a product between t and f of t, uh, convert towards su, please, no, no need to convert to su, okay. Uh, that's just going to be the derivative of big F with respect to s up to a sign change, okay? So I'm gonna show, show you guys how to do this. Um, 
this is actually much straight, much more straightforward than it looks. Okay, so what do I know? What we know, what we have, let's just put that down. What we have is that the Laplace transform of f of t is equal to big F of s, right? That's the only given we have so far. Our goal is to compute the Laplace transform of the product of t and f of t. So let's go ahead and try to compute that. Well, I know what the formal definition of, of the Laplace transform is, right? It's already here on the left-hand side of the equation. So maybe let's actually write, write down, write down our, what we have in our goal in two different colors. So what we have is that green, our goal, let's put it in yellow, oh, not green, blue. Goal is to find the Laplace of T, F of T. I need to find a way to relate the original expression to um, this expression, T of F, T. So let's start. From what we have, we know that F of S is just the integral by definition of zero to infinity, e to the minus st, f of t, dt. If I wanna compute its derivative with respect to s, I hold t constant. So f prime of s is just hold t constant, I bring down a minus t, right? E, sorry, minus t, e to the minus st, f of t is also held constant, dt. And we're actually done. Why? I bring out the minus sign, zero to infinity, e to the minus st times t, f of t, dt. By definition, this integral over here it's just the Laplace of whatever is inside here. So by the definition of the Laplace transform, this is just negative the Laplace of T times F of T. And you're done. Or let's put that as a, as a end of proof. So. Mm -hmm. Why can I differentiate like this? Um, T doesn't change, right? T is held constant. So even if I integrate first, that t is going to stay wherever it is with respect to s. Um, so where did the t? I differentiate e to the minus st with respect to s. Okay, so again, I hold t constant, treat t as a constant. And you're free to use this now. So if you're trying to integrate a real, or so if you're trying to find the Laplace of a product of t and f t, just compute the Laplace of f of t and then differentiate with respect to s. I'll do one example of this um, in the next problem, and then um, I'll let you guys work on the others. Okay? Can I? Uh, oh, sorry. Any questions? So this is the only problem today that requires um, the definition of the Laplace transform. Everything else should be doable by our table. No questions, All right. So let's go ahead. Fun, we have our table of Laplace transforms on the left. I've included the first and second shifting theorems in case we need them. We have four functions and we wanna find the Laplace transform of those functions. I'm gonna do A and if anyone wants to do B, C, D, uh, we're gonna to have to ask for volunteers for that. Okay, so I'm gonna do A. What is the Laplace transform of T sine T? By our first problem, the Laplace transform of a product of t and a function is just negative the derivative of fs. This is just negative the derivative of f prime, uh, negative the derivative of f of s. So this is with respect to s, right? So with respect to s. So let's go ahead and first compute what f of s is. I have f of s um, is sine t, the Laplace transform of sine t. Is it on our table? Yeah, a over s squared plus a squared, where a is one. So that's just s squared plus one. Oops, 
s squared plus one to the power of nine minus one. So what is the Laplace transform of t sine t? I just differentiate my expression here with respect to s. That's d ds of one over s squared plus one. Low times the derivative of, high. oh no, no need to do that. Oh, sorry, negative. Um, I, I'll just bring down the minus one and then differentiate the inside, right? So this is just gonna be minus, the negative cancels out with the negative in front of the DDS. So I have two S all over S squared plus one squared. And that's it. Of course, if you wanted to find this from scratch, you could do the whole, okay, zero to infinity e to the minus S T T sine T, but you're gonna have to do some crazy by parts here to um, deal with all three of those factors. Um, but now because of this nice property, I can just differentiate my function in S. Okay, B, C, D, does anyone need any of B, C or D done? If not, we skip. Okay, B, there's a request to do B. C and D are both okay? Oh, sorry, C, not, not B, okay, do C. Okay, I think D should be easy, huh? Just convert to your cosine or use the differentiation rule. Um, this one also easy, that's just for shifting. Theorem. So if you need to check, um, this is just two over s plus three cube. So that was originally a two over s cube and then you shift your s to s plus three. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll write the quick working there. It was originally two over s cube where s becomes s plus three. So it's two over s plus three cube. And then d, uh, you should have gotten two over s times s squared plus four. Okay, who wants to do C or who wants to get me started on C and I can help you finish? Anyone? Has working for C. There's a unit step there, so it should be automatic what result or what you need to do to start. Anyone? Okay, I'm assuming you're gonna use the previous result. So this one, in this case, the FT will be U oh, you want to use a fuse? Okay, that's fine. Yep, let's do that. So ft is ut minus two. Let's see if we can do that. Okay. Okay, and then? Uh, when you put that Laplace transform, I think you're supposed to resolve the ut first. So technically what it becomes is one. Okay, ut minus two, right? Yeah, ut minus two. Is, is here, right? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be e to the minus 2s over s. And then what happens if I um, use it? Yep. yep. Yeah, I'm just going to differentiate. So my L of t, ut minus 2, I'm going to differentiate or take the negative of the derivative with respect to s of e to the minus 2s over s. A bit long, but doable. Uh, do you want to do product rule? No, let's let's do um, uh, quotient rule on this. Uh, low times the derivative of high is minus two e to the minus two s, minus e to the minus two s times one, all over low squared. Final answer. I can factor out an e to the minus two s, and distribute my negative sign. I have a one over s squared plus two over S. Good, that's it. Any questions? Ah, very fun. I'm gonna do it in another way. So this is one way of doing it. And this is again, this is illustrating the power of your, of this first theorem. Oh, I was hoping you go through the whole UT part. So the second way I'm going to do it is I'm going to go through the whole UT. Well, I don't know what you mean by go through the whole UT, but I'm going to use, so let's duplicate this. I'm going to use the second shifting theorem. Oh, you wanted to like uh, activate the function. That, that works too. 
that's fine too. It's just that what we're trying to do now is we're going to try to avoid using much as we can help it just because sometimes it's fairly difficult to compute integrals, right? So here's another way that I am going to do this. This is a function of t times a unit step. So this second method is going to work no matter what the function of t is. In the case that it's just t, then I can use my differentiation rule, right? However, I know that this can use, this can employ, or we can employ the second shifting theorem here. And what does the second shifting theorem say? If I'm taking the Laplace transform of f of t times ut minus two, this is equal to e to the minus two s as the Laplace transform of f of t plus a. This is just my direct application of the second, by the second shifting theorem. All right, so what is this gonna be? F of t is two, or sorry, F of t is t. So we just have e to the minus two s times the Laplace transform of t plus two. This is plus a plus two now, because we've already substituted the exact value of a. Do we get the same answer? Oh, it's e to the minus two s. Laplace transform of t is this with n equals one, so one over s squared. Laplace transform of two is two over s. Same answer. So we're good to go. So you're free to use whichever method you want. So in general, because of the algebraic properties of the Laplace transform, you're now free to use any method. In this case, we've seen a method of using differentiation, which we proved in the first problem. Alternatively, if you're not comfortable with that, um, you can use the second shifting theorem as well, because the second shifting theorem works with any function multiplied by the unit step. All right. Good. So, and I think as you can see, there's not one method that's e necessarily easier or harder than the other. They're both roughly fairly simple. It's just a matter of which one you are more comfortable with. Okay. First, no, it's not first shifting, it's second shifting. Why is it second shifting? Because of the product with the unit step. The moment you see the unit step function, the only rule you have for multiplication with a unit step is the second shifting. Any questions? None. Okay, good. Okay, inverse Laplace transform of these two functions, are these okay or do these need some work? Anyone? Are people okay with these two inverting the Laplace or? People good with this. Does anyone need either of these to be worked on or no? Hello? Hello? Yes, no? Should I just give you the answer? Yeah, okay, I'll just give the answer to check, huh? Okay, for A, final answer is e to the minus 5t cosine t minus 5 sine t. For B, it's going to be um, t squared over two minus two activated at time two, ut minus two. You need B? Okay, so let's do B. All right, so let's find the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus two s, one plus two s divided by s cubed. Um, Anyone wants to help me get started and I can help you finish it? So we're gonna work on B. Anyone? Yes, no? Um, you split it yeah. into two fractions. Okay, so we're gonna split into two fractions. What are the two fractions gonna be? Um, one over S cubed plus two over S squared. One over S cubed plus two over S squared, awesome. 
Now, um, I'm just going to ask you really quickly, uh, what does the e to the minus 2s suggest for us? Like, what do you think is going to happen because there's an e to the minus 2s showing up? Uh, what's that called? The unit function. The unit step, right? So automatically, if inside the s world we have an e showing up, our second shifting theorem comes into play again, because it's here where we have a product of e to the minus a s right, times an f of s. So maybe let's, let's write this here. This is an e to the minus a s times a function of s. This is from our second shifting theorem. OK, good. Um, so Shantan, do you want to finish that off? So how do we invert this? And then um, you add a 2 factorial to the top, to the numerator. To the numerator of uh, which? 1 over s cubed. 1 over s cubed. You're going to add a 2 factorial. OK, sure. So you're going to do a 1 over s cubed is equal to 2 factorial. Uh, half times 2 over s cubed. So two, 2 factorial over s cubed times a half, right? Yeah. So let's, yeah, good. I'll just rewrite that. And the way to, the reason we want to do this is uh, we, can we want to, t to yeah, we want to use t squared. Okay, so this is just going to be t squared over 2. Okay, so maybe I should put the inverse Laplace sign so that we know what we're doing. Inverse Laplace of this is the inverse Laplace of this. And that gets me a 1 half t squared. Good. What about the 2 over s squared? That's uh, t. Just t. Awesome. Um, any scalar? Uh, 2t. 2t. Yes, don't forget your 2, right? OK, good. So we have now converted our two terms. This becomes a t squared over 2 without the e. This becomes a 2t without the e. So now we want to account for the e. What do we do? Multiply it by ut minus 2. Multiply it by the unit step. And what is the function that we multiply it to? Just t squared over 2 and 2t? Two ah, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, careful. Nope. <laughs> so we're like, okay, ut minus 2, t squared over 2 times, oh, sorry, plus 2t. However, remember, we need the function to be in sync with the unit step. So there's actually an extra part here where this needs to replace every instance of t with? Oh, t minus 2. t minus 2, exactly. Okay, so be very careful, okay? So what we've done is whenever we see this exponential, two things are automatically gonna come into play. The first thing is that the unit step shows up. The second thing is when we convert, I replace my t with t minus two. So I need to take this additional step of replacing t with t minus two to sync up my function, move the origin entirely to time two. So I'm um, just simplify this. This is going to be u t minus two times t squared over two minus two. If you want to expand that, that's fine. So the t minus two squared over two plus two t minus two, and then just simplify it. Yeah. Okay. So be very very careful. Um, what you really need is both a unit step and the original function shifted by a two. Okay, these are still the straightforward ones because we're only applying the shifting theorems one at a time. Later, we see what happens if we have to apply the shifting theorems at the same time, or both shifting theorems in one go. Okay, good, good, good. No problem. Thank you, Shanshan. Good work. Um, all right, any questions about this? All right. This is a bit tricky, yeah. So um, only thing to remember is always remember, keep track. Are you doing the shift in S or are you doing the shift in T? In both of your shifting theorems, you need to do a shift usually after the conversion has happened and not before converting. So um, just keep track. Am I going to do the shift in S or am I going to do the shift in T? 
questions? Right. Okay, so let's continue. Um, this one I will do, uh, I'll do for y'all, but do you want me to do A or B? I'll do one of them. Anyone? Or are both of these okay? Also, uh, <laughs> you have to use the Laplace transform. So please do not try to cheat and like, oh, lambda squared minus two lambda is equal to zero homogeneous, non-homogeneous part. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, do A. All right. So I'm going to do A. All right. So what does the differential equation convert to? Remember, we take the Laplace transform of both sides. So on the left, I take the Laplace transform of y prime. On the right, I take the Laplace transform of t, u t minus two. The Laplace, oh, okay. Somebody also wants to do b. Okay, we do both then. <laughs> the Laplace transform of y prime is just s l y minus y zero. The Laplace transform of t, u t minus two, we did two pages ago here, c, right? e to the minus two s over one over, times one over s squared plus two over s. So from the previous problem, the right-hand side is just e to the minus two s times one over s squared plus two over s. This is from problem one. y zero we're given is equal to four. So all I need to do now is to find an expression for L of y, okay? so. Let's, let's isolate L of y. This is just e to the minus two s. I have one over s squared. Um, actually, let's, all, let's divide throughout by s already. So one over s cubed plus two over s squared plus four over s. This is equal to e to the minus two s times one plus two s over s cubed plus four over four times one over s. So what does that tell me about the original function y? I just inverse Laplace the entire thing. E to the minus two s over times one plus two s over s cubed, I think we've done in the previous page. Yeah, we've done it e to the minus 2s times 1 plus 2s over s cubed is just this thing over here. So I can already plug that in. So my first term is just going to be um, t squared over 2 minus 2 times the unit step, t minus 2, plus 4 times 1 over s is just going to be 4, because 1 over s is just 1. And this is my particular solution to the initial value problem. Any questions? Very um, straightforward. Um, for B, let's do B. The starting point is the same, right? E left plus both sides. This is plus four because it was minus four on the left. So we to move it to the right, it becomes a plus four. I should use the red, not the blue. Okay, we're gonna do B. I'm gonna take the Laplace of both sides. So the Laplace of Y prime prime, let's just put that there is S L Y, sorry, S squared L Y minus S Y zero, decreasing powers of S minus Y prime zero. And L Y prime is equal to S L Y minus Y zero. So now I'm ready to take the Laplace transform of both sides. Y prime prime, S squared L Y minus S, Y zero is one, so minus S, Y prime zero is zero. Minus two, Y primes Laplace transform, so S L Y um, minus two because of my Y zero. 
is equal to the Laplace transform of four, four over S. I'm just going to isolate L of Y to its own side. Okay, uh, I'm gonna group that. So I have S squared minus two S times L of Y, move the rest of the terms to the other side. This is equal to four minus two S plus S squared all over S. And so Ly is equal to four minus two S plus S squared all over S squared times S minus two. This is our first stopping point. We have found the Laplace transform of um, the L of Y. Is it minus two or plus two? On the right hand side, it's a minus two. Oh, this is a plus two, sorry. Yes, because it's a minus negative two. Yeah, so it's a plus two, thanks. So we're ready to invert. Um, I have a factoring, a factoring in my denominator. It's a factorization in my denominator. So that automatically tells me partial fractions. Okay, so if I partial fraction decomposition, um, this is going to be s squared plus s minus 2. Combining, that's going to be a times s minus 2 plus b s squared over s squared times s minus 2. Um, is it obvious what a and b are going to become? Right off the bat, maybe not. But if I take a look at this, this is this numerator is just s squared. I can factor out a minus two, s minus two. So I can compare directly. I don't need to do a full expansion. Coefficient of s squared is one. So b is equal to one. And coefficient of s minus two is negative two. So a is equal to negative two. Okay, so I'm just gonna write this on the tiny corner here. What is y? y is just the inverse Laplace transform of minus two over s squared. This is post partial fraction decomposition plus one over s minus two. Let's do it term by term. My s squared just becomes a t. So I have a factor of two. This is gonna become minus two t. And one over s minus two is just an exponential by two, so plus e to the two t. And this is my solution for y. So again, the steps are fairly straightforward. Laplace both sides, isolate L of y and use algebra to get it into an expression whose inversion you can do fairly easily or fair directly. Any questions? I spilled my coffee. Good. Okay, let's do this problem. I have a solid object with mass M immersed in water and I do stuff so that if initially it's at rest, there is a pulse, for example, a wave that pushes my object and this is the dynamic equation. Um, let's just investigate what the dynamic equation says about my object, okay? so. Mass times d squared x dt squared, that's just acceleration. So you know that this is an expression for force. This is just mass times acceleration, Newton second law is equal to minus some constant a dx dt is velocity. So you have a force that is proportional to velocity. It's negative, so it's a force in the opposite direction. So that's most likely your um, friction, right? Proportional to velocity plus b delta t. b is a constant, but what does delta t tell me? Whatever the constant b is, is just applied at time zero. So this corresponds to your pulse. Okay, an instantaneous pulse at time zero. So hopefully later when we see instances where we want to model a sudden phenomenon, we can use the Dirac delta to do that for us. Okay, so I just want to determine the location x as a function of time t. That just means I want to solve 
the differential equation for the function x of t, okay? So how do I solve a differential equation where the Dirac delta shows up? I just take the Laplace of both sides. So I'm going to take the Laplace transform of mx dot dot is equal to minus a. Oh, so I can factor out my m already because it's constant, right? m l x dot dot is equal to minus a l x dot plus b l of the Dirac delta. Term by term, this is going to be m s squared lx, all of my initial conditions are zero, so I don't have any other terms. So I can leave it like that. Is equal to minus a, slx, all other terms are zero by my initial conditions, plus b, Laplace of the Dirac delta is just one. So what does this give me for my l of x? l of x is equal to b all over, um, I have an m s squared plus a s. Okay. So equating this to something that I can maybe, well, okay, you look at your denominator and you're like, okay, can I invert this directly? I don't really have an s squared plus s in any of my denominators. So let's try to factor that out, b over s times ms plus a. Now, we're like, okay, we need to somehow clean this up, no choice, partial fraction decomposition. So let's decompose this into its partial fractions. The two denominators are s and ms plus a, linear factors. What are the numerators? We don't know, um, but please do not use A and B again. Usually, right, we use A and B for the numerator, but don't use A and B because it's a different A and B from the one given in the problem. So just for fun, because we can do whatever we want, um, we can put whatever symbol we want. So you can put like star and square and then just solve for star and square. But um, this is a math class, so I'll, I'll teach you all some basic Greek. This is capital phi. And this is capital C, you know, just like capital Greek letters if you run out of the Roman alphabet. So if we expand this, I need to be able to equate to B, right? So expanding this, this is going to be, I need a coefficient of S. So I have a CS and a phi M. So I have a phi M plus C S plus phi A all over s times m s plus a. We equate the coefficients of s and the constant term. So b has to be equal to v a and v m plus c has to be equal to zero. So what are your two coefficients? Well, very nice, just isolate. B is equal to B over A, and C is equal to negative BM over A, and just replace. So X, I can go back now to my original differential equation solution. X is the inverse Laplace transform of B over S, MS plus A, which we've already done the partial fraction decomposition of. B over A times one over S minus BM over A, times one over ms plus a. This is just b over a, I can factor out times the inverse Laplace of one over s minus b over a, I can factor out and then I can distribute the m in to cancel out, to make my denominator more clean. One over s plus a over m. Oh, and nice, we have terms whose inverses we know. One over S just becomes one and one over S plus A over M just becomes an exponential. Okay, so is there enough space? Now let's, let's copy this to the next page. 
let's not let's not be stingy with space. Okay. So this is post partial fraction decomposition. So we're just ready to invert now. X is equal to B over A times one minus E to the minus T A over M. Done. Now, what does it say about the motion of your um, object in the water? It's a negative exponential, right? Um, and that sort of that sort of makes sense. There's that initial pulse that pushes your object up at time zero. This is why this function starts at time zero because the pulse occurs at time zero. So there's already a push up at time zero, and then it's just going to slowly, by virtue of your restoring force, return slowly return to your equilibrium. Okay. Any questions about this? None. All right, if there are no questions, time now is 2.50. Let's take a five minute break. Um, oh yeah, okay, I'll explain the motion. Uh, at time zero, this is just going to be X is equal to B over A. So at time zero, it's going to be here because of that initial pulse. And then I subtract an exponential term. So if I'm subtracting an exponential, let, let's just draw this graph. So it's, we know it's gonna tend back towards zero. So let's just draw this graph more accurate, accurately. One minute. So it will look something like, uh, mm, how, how should I draw this? So it's going to be that, oh, sorry, it's zero at time. Ooh, careful. Uh, so when I plug in X at zero, so, oh yeah, so it's zero at time zero. Yeah, thanks. And then it's gonna push up to B over A and then slowly taper off like that. Yep, yep. So it's close to over damping in a way. All right, okay. So let's take a five minute break. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be here. Uh, so we have two more problems and those two problems are a bit long. So we'll, we'll take our time with those after the break. But yeah, um, if there are any questions, feel free to shoot while I settle my coffee stain table. Uh, Christian, yes. can you go through the, you know, the transform drill question mm -hmm. 19? Can you like write down step by step and explain? Because I really don't understand. Okay, question 19. Wait, uh, give me like 30 seconds as I make sure that there are no ants attracted to <laughs> my table. Oh, shit. Okay, let me just transfer this to my glass. And this should be good. So question 19, okay, if I do question 19, y'all should be able to do question 20 on your own. Okay, so I'm gonna do question 19 of the Laplace transform drills. Let me just make sure that, oh, accidents today. Okay, question 19. Oh shoot, there's more. Wait, give me like two minutes. We have time today, so I, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah. Uh, Christian, yes. just check for the current question, this mm -hmm. one of the immersed in water one, why does it taper off? Um, because of your restoring force A dx dt. So look at the forces that are acting on your object. Mm -hmm. The only two forces acting on the object are the initial pulse and the minus a dx dt, which tells you that you have 
a restoring force proportional to velocity. Oh, prop, <clears throat> I have a question. Are you sure uh, x point zero equals to zero? Sorry? Um, are you sure x point zero equals x to dot zero? zero? Yeah, um, it's given, it's a given. It's not, yeah, it's given as part of the problem. But according to the equation you have calculated, I think it's not. Because it? when you graph out the final one, it actually gives the exponential growth that stagnates at b over a. I just calculate the derivative. The derivative of x. Of the x. Equation. Yeah, right. You have I think calculated. that, right, right. The tricky part with this is because of your Dirac delta. And the fact that your Dirac delta is being applied at time zero as well. So think about it this way. Um, what? I can, there are two, for, okay, I'll use radioactive, I'll do on problem 19 after this, okay? But um, I'm gonna use radioactive decay as an example. One way I can interpret radioactive decay is my object is already there and then it starts decaying over time. Another way I can interpret radioactive decay is that there is no object, but I an, introduce an object at time zero. So, okay, let, let's do this. So, Radioactive decay, normally we're like, okay, um, the, uh, the amount, the radioactive dx dt uh, is proportional to the amount present where at time zero, you have a certain initial amount, let's say A of the radioactive object. Another way I can do this is that, and this is the power of your Dirac delta, it's proportional to the amount present. I assume there is nothing at time zero, but I add maybe a hundred grams at time zero. These two are the same, or maybe let's let's put let's change a to a hundred. What? Why are they the same? <laughs> this is taking into account this x zero equals 100. Because this means that there's nothing but at time zero, I suddenly add 100. It's a little complicated. Um, yeah, so it's a bit weird. And that's because, that's because the Dirac delta is not a function in the normal sense of the word function, right? It doesn't operate in the, in the way that a normal function would. So this is why it's a bit tricky, but the way we want to read this, and if we have time today, I want to do um, an example of a problem like this, is that uh, think of it as the amount of radioactive substance in a room. At time zero, I add, yeah, so um, Eugene has to, for example, if I add the substance at time one, then this is gonna be minus Kx plus 100 delta, oh, sorry, not delta zero, this is delta T minus zero. So this is just delta T, oops, sorry, delta T. T minus one, this would look like a situation where there is zero stuff in the room, and then at time one, I introduce the radioactive substance, say I drop um, uranium into the room. I'm just doing this at time zero. So instead of putting my initial condition as I have 100 initially, I'm thinking of it as some stuff that's happening over time. And it just so happens that something happens at time zero when I start counting time. Uh. But if I plot out the data, it looks a bit strange. The which data? Maybe I'll just send a link to the the one for like the that. last. Mm -hmm. It it doesn't sort of... look like it returns. It's still to... not the same. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can try solving both of these differential equations. You should get the same solution. These two. Uh, okay, so your graph is, oh, where does it tend towards? Huh. So it just like, the, the asymptote is, ah, uh, the asymptote is B over A. Mm -hmm. And I guess in terms of the function, that what, the function is, what is it? XT B over A. I guess, yeah, because this starts at 
wait. So this starts at one and then gets smaller and s oh and it mm. yeah so what would that mean for the motion of our x point zero is not equal to two sorry sorry oh, what is here? no no so that's the idea here right in this case um this doesn't mean that there's no initial thing the initial thing would have been 100 but we write our initial condition as x0 equals 0 because that initial condition is accounted for by your Dirac delta. Yeah, so that's, that's the tricky part with this Dirac delta function. So why should we add the delta t? Um, this will work because this can account for you adding stuff. So at time zero, then it's, yeah, sure, just use this, right? If that's the only thing. But what happens if you add a radioactive substance every 10 seconds? Then it's going to be, okay, delta T minus 10. I add another 100 grams, delta T minus 20. And you have a lot of terms with the Dirac delta. The only way you can, you cannot deal with that, all of that, if you just use this. Of course, if it's just time zero, then that's fine. But um, so technically speaking, um, we could have redone this where instead of this B delta T, we could have just taken an initial, we, we could have just changed our initial conditions that a velocity is imparted at time zero. We could have just changed this as X zero equals zero and then X dot zero, I think it would work if we use B. Yeah. So that, that's the weird thing with the um, Dirac delta function now. Um, but yeah, okay this, is, okay, this is interesting because yeah, this is my solution. And it, this goes, the range of this function is one, um, one and then it's low, it, it goes to zero as t increases. So I guess it's not, uh, so what then does this tell me? Um, it starts at zero and then it goes up to b over a, it approaches b over a. But what does that? Yeah, so it's not a, an oscillator. It's closer to maybe it's, it's not immersed in, oh, but if it's water, then it would make sense to make the um, object oscillate. Yeah, so you, you push a block and it slows down fast. But the thing is we're measuring position with respect to the origin. Oh, it's horizontal. Ah, yeah, so yeah, horizontal. Uh. Thank you, Alvin. <laughs> the force is horizontal. Oh, now I feel stupid. The force is horizontal, so we're not thinking of it as going up and down. We push something and then it's slow. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Alvin. Yeah. So this represents the horizontal motion of your object. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. Good, very good. Is it the next, oh, I was thinking about the next question. Yes, the next question is vertical motion. This is just horizontal motion. The constant B over A is how far it'll end up traveling. Yeah. So I'll do um, problem 19 in the uh, drills. Problem 19 is solve the differential equation. So I think we have a bit of time today. So uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and do this. Uh, let, let me fire up the, the file. Solve the differential equation y prime is equal to the sum from i equals one to infinity of delta t minus i, where your initial condition is y zero is equal to zero. I'm just gonna Laplace both sides, okay? SLY minus y zero is equal to the sum of the Laplace transforms of the Dirac delta. This is just SLY, Y zero is zero. So this is just the sum of E to the minus I S. So LY is equal to the sum of E to the minus I S all over S because I divide S to all of my terms. Invert, Y is equal to the sum of the inverse Laplaces of E to the minus I S over S. But this is just your unit step function. So what does this mean? 
This is a function where at every time one, two, three, four, five, so on and so forth, I add one. I keep on adding plus one, plus one at every time. One, 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 so on and so forth. So it's like an infinite staircase going up. Okay, does that, I'm not sure who asked this earlier, is it Jason? But yes. Wait, uh, like isn't U T minus anything supposed to be just cat at one? Oh, why, but why would so what is this? Let's add this, uh, let's write this. This is U T minus one plus U T minus two plus, you're not subtracting anything. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good, good. Awesome. Okay. Ah, uh, let's let's do this. This is the problem I was thinking of just now. Uh, oil tanker is at rest at an almost calm sea, and it is hit by a rogue wave at time big T, which instantaneously imparts an upward vertical momentum. So just to recap, what did we see in tutorial two? Is it still here? Do we still have it? It was before this. Oh, yeah, we still have it. So this is from tutorial two, right? Uh, we wanted to model the motion of this oil tanker where X of T is the distance from middle to, or from the sea level to the bottom of the ship. So let's just copy this to our um, current page. Oops, sorry. So this was our model for the oil tanker. Okay, now, um, what was our original differential equation? Maybe that's what we should put here. Our original differential equation was a simple harmonic oscillator, right? It was x dot dot is equal to minus omega squared x, where omega is your angular frequency is root rho ag over m. So the first question is, I want to investigate what the force of the wave is, the force of the rogue wave exerted um, on the ship. There are a few things we need to be careful of here. First thing is that, okay, we're figuring out the force of the rogue wave. First thing is that it's an instantaneous force applied onto the ship. And that force has upward vertical momentum P. Okay, um, what do we know about momentum? Momentum is just the time integral of force. And I think that was given as a hint for you guys, right? So we know that your momentum is equal to the time integral of your force It's upward and we've said that upward is going to be negative because the larger the X, the further down my ship goes. So my rogue wave, the momentum is negative P is going to be the time integral of whatever your force function is. So let's integrate from zero to infinity. Let's call this F of T for now, F of T dt, where this is the force imparted by the rogue wave. Okay, now here's a question. What is our expression for this force? We don't know what its magnitude is. So let's give the magnitude um, its own letters. So if the magnitude of the force is say script F, let's use this as the magnitude of the force, script F, then what does the instantaneous application tell me? It means that that script F only gets activated at time big T and then gets removed immediately. Then your force is going to be script F. How do I account for something that's activated and deactivated all of a sudden? Dirac delta at time big T. 
Okay. So minus p is zero to infinity of some constant times the Dirac delta at time big T dt. We know what this is equal to. This is just the value of the function at time t, but it's constant. So this is just equal to f. So what does this tell us about the magnitude of the force? It's just equal to minus p, right? We're, why did we have to do this? Because we're given the momentum, but we're not given the force. So if you want to deduce the force, we have to express it in terms of the momentum. So the magnitude of the force is minus p. And what is the force of the wave? Well, we said it's the magnitude of the force times delta t minus big T. So it's going to be minus p times delta t minus big T. This is the force of the wave. So the Dirac delta is helpful for modeling phenomena that is instantaneously applied and taken out. Question so far? Um, solve for the downward displacement of the ship. Solve for xt. So let's duplicate this page. It's f times the integral of direct delta, which is on. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Also, we said in class last week that the integral of a function multiplied by the direct delta cf times c is just f of c. Or you can just factor out your big F and then integrate under that as well. Okay, let's erase this. So we now know that the force of the wave is minus P delta T minus T. So we modify our differential equation to account for this new force. Okay, let's modify the differential equation. Well, X dot dot is equal to minus omega squared X. I add my new force, that's P delta T minus T but was there anything in front of x before I, uh, x dot dot that I before I isolated? Yeah, there was a mass factor, so I need to divide this by the mass of the ship. Or if you want, you can construct everything from m a blah blah blah. But you're just going to end up adding the spare term plus p delta t minus t, and then just dividing that by mass. So that's fine. How do we solve this differential equation? We are just going to, no choice, use the Laplace transform. Okay, so I'm gonna Laplace both sides. Oh, let's use a, the red. Laplace both sides, this is just going to be S squared LX minus SX zero minus X dot zero is equal to negative omega squared is constant, Lx plus P over M Laplace of the Dirac delta at time big T. The ship is initially at rest. So this is zero, this is zero. I am left with S squared Lx, let's move all of your Lx's to the other side, plus omega squared Lx is equal to P over M. Laplace transform of the Dirac delta is just your exponential e to the minus t s. So Lx is just divide both sides by s squared plus omega squared minus P over M times e to the minus t s times one over s squared plus omega squared. So what does this tell me about the function x of t of my ship? Minus P over M is constant, so that's good. If I have an exponential in the red, that means I have a shifting theorem in play. 
So on this, let's, let's already keep track of what's gonna happen. This tells me that I have a unit step at time big T. And in addition, wherever T shows up, I need to replace with T minus big T, okay? This is from the second shifting theorem. Y minus P over M. Oh, did I forget a sign? Oh, I forgot this is negative sign. So yeah, thanks. It's minus everywhere actually. This is minus, this is minus. Yeah, there you go. Makes sense. Because it's a minus sign for the force. Okay, so I have a minus P over M. I have a U, T minus big T. And I have a one over S squared plus omega squared. Does that look like anything? It looks sort of like a sign, but I need an omega in the numerator as well. So I'm gonna have to rewrite this as one over omega times omega over S squared plus omega squared. I have a factor of one over omega sine omega. Normally it's just T, but I said I'm gonna replace every instance of T with T minus big T. So this is my the motion of my ship. Okay, I'm just going to copy this to the next page. Let's just clean that up xt is equal to minus p over omega m um, u t minus big t sine omega t minus big t. Um, so the first thing we ask is, does, does this solution make sense, right? What does this say? Um, my x is going to be a sine graph that starts at big T. So it's zero everywhere because of the unit step. And then at big T, it becomes a sine graph. What is the amplitude of this? It's the coefficient minus P over omega M. Um, does this make sense? Yeah, because it's at rest until time big T. So it's not moving until time big T. And then when time big T hits, there's that push and it starts to oscillate as it normally would. So how far does the ship go down if it doesn't sink? The amplitude, P over omega M. Oh, there's a minus sign. So it's gonna go, X of T is gonna go down first, sorry. So this is minus sign. So it's gonna be, yeah. Where this is um, your minus P over omega. Sign X is odd. Yeah, so it will flip. Yes, good. So what this means is that negative displacement is upwards. So that makes sense. Yeah, it's going to push the ship up first and then it's going to go down and then back. So maximum downward distance is minus P over omega, which is your amplitude. Okay, can you repeat the multiplication of Dirac delta and the force? Ah, okay. So the idea is that I wanna figure out what the force of the wave is. If the force of the wave were just constant, that would just be, let's say big F, that's it, constant value. However, it's not a constant force that's applied over all time. It's a constant force that's only applied instantaneously. So the wave, Model instantaneous um, uh, instantaneous phenomenon is by multiplying the Dirac delta. What this means is that this function only gets activated at time big T, and then turned off right after it's active. So it's like it's a burst of a function at time big T. Okay.
Any other questions? Um, okay. Let's go to the last one. Uh, the last one is a bit interesting. Oh, can you explain the max downward displacement? Um, so my ship, this is the sea level. This is D plus X, right? So what is the furthest X that it can go down? It's the amplitude of your oscillation, right? This is the furthest P over omega M plus P over omega, oh, sorry, minus P over omega M goes up plus P over omega M goes down. What condition will make it sink if the height of the ship is less than P over omega M? No worries. Okay, last. Uh, this one is a bit tricky, so let's do this carefully. Yeah, this is the, that's why I put this for the last problem. I have a, okay, there's a long story about being a good engineering student. Go read that. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, I have a circuit, I essentially have a gadget, and um, the current in a circuit, in any circuit, satisfies this differential equation. Okay, Vt is equal to resistance times current plus inductance times the first derivative of current plus one over C, the integral, time integral of your current, okay? At time two, a short burst of voltage is fired into a gadget and the current is measured to be this. If the resistance is known, find the values of inductance and capacitance. Um, no physics required for this. This is just, here's a differential equation. Here is a differential equation. Here is a solution to the differential equation. If you know one of the unknowns, find the other unknowns, L and C. Okay, so that's the essence of this question. Now, let's start by trying to model what's happening here, okay? A burst of voltage. So let, let's start with our differential. What's the DE? Our DE is V of T. is equal to Ri plus Li dot, oh, sorry, dot um, plus one over C integral from zero to T I dt. What can we substitute? Well, we know that we're gonna essentially try to solve for I, solve for I, because that is the solution that we are given in our differential, for our differential equation. Or, okay, maybe the solution is not, I shouldn't say solve for I because that's not what the question is talking about. Our, the solution is in I. The solution to this DE is I of T, okay? You know the resistance, so you know what the value of R is. You don't know what the values of L and C are, but if I wanna solve this differential equation, you start asking yourself, okay, First of all, what is the order of this differential equation? Okay, it's a first order in I. Uh, I'm looking for the first derivative, but this is, does not look like a normal differential equation because we have an integral showing up in the differential equation. This is the first differential equation we've seen where there's an integral showing up inside. So how do we solve a differential equation when there's an integral? Sorry, Laplace does that for us, right? If we go back to our first page today, um, there's a very nice rule that tells me that I can easily take the Laplace transform of an integral. Okay, so the moment you see an integral in your differential equation, sorry, this automatically calls for the Laplace transform. So we're gonna have to Laplace the DE. However, okay, I'm gonna Laplace this, 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 good. I also need to Laplace the left-hand side, the, uh, the voltage. Do I know what the voltage of, um, the situation is. No information given, but at time two, a short burst of voltage is fired. So a burst of voltage is fired. What is VT? The voltage is only fired at time two. It's turned on and turned off at time two. So it's going to be some magnitude, let's call that big V, times the Dirac delta at time two. Again, what does this mean? This just means that I am introducing a certain magnitude of voltage immediately at time two and taking it away 
right after I, it's been introduced. So it's like, poof, um, turn the gadget on and off automatically, right? It's not even on for an amount of time. It's just on for like a certain moment. Where V is an unknown, where V is the magnitude of the voltage. So what does our, um, should this be added to the line before? Um, oh no, so now we're gonna rewrite our differential equation. Right, so what does the differential equation become? The differential equation becomes V times delta T minus two is equal to Ri plus Li dot plus one over C integral from zero to T I dt. And now we're ready to take the Laplace transform because all of the unknowns are just constants. Okay, no longer functions of T. So take the Laplace transform of both sides. The left-hand side is going to be V is constant. Laplace transform of the delta is E. So this is just E to the minus two S is equal to R times the Laplace transform of I plus L times first derivative of I is S L I minus I zero plus one over C. Let's put this the Laplace transform of the integral from zero to T of I. Okay, um, do we know what the current is at time zero? Yeah, the gadget is turned off at time zero. So this current is just zero at time zero. So what does our differential equation become in the Laplace world? V times e to the minus two s is equal to R L I plus S L L I. So the script L means Laplace and the big L means L. Why the V has no change after transform? V is a constant, right? So this is the entire function of V. It's a burst at time two. V is the magnitude, so it's a constant. Delta T minus two is the sort of change that happens. Integral, Laplace transform of the integral is just your formula. It's just one over S L I. So this is just, sorry, let's, this is, okay. So this is just plus, one over C S L I. So I'm ready to solve for my L I. L I isolating it on one side of the equation is just V S E to the minus two S times, sorry, let's just write that in. Uh, or divided by rather, SR plus S squared L plus one over C to the minus. So I've just isolated LI here. Okay, any questions so far? All I've done is two things. First, find an expression for VT so that I can write my differential equation into something I can now solve. Second, I took the Laplace transform of both sides applying the Laplace transform of an integral rule in order to find the Laplace transform of I. Questions? None. Okay, let's duplicate this. So now I am about to solve my differential equation. So what do I know? Let's copy that. Li from, uh, from the DE from the differential equation, I know what Li is equal to. Li is equal to V, let's write that as a proper fraction, Vse to the minus two S all over Sr plus S squared L plus one over C. Now, of course your next step will be, okay, let's try to invert to find I of T but you're like, I want to invert, but I cannot invert if I don't know what the numbers in the denominator are. So we're kind of stuck here. If we want to proceed from directly solving the differential equation, we are going to need to figure out what the numbers are, but we don't know what they are yet. That's the goal of the problem. However, we do know that the solution is IT. We've been told what the solution is. This is the solution to the DE, to the differential equation. 
So if we have the Laplace transform of the solution and we already know the solution, we can just Laplace this and compare our two Laplace expressions, right? So we're just going to, so we're, to more easily do this, instead of solving directly for i, we can just compare with the Laplace transform of i of the given solution, of the given solution. So let's now find the Laplace transform of i of the given solution. This, we have to be very careful. Why do we have to be careful here? First, there is a unit step, which means that we have a shift that happens in t. Second, there is an exponential, which means there is a shift that happens in s. Okay, so this is an example of a case where we have a shift that happens in both your s and t, and we have to keep track of when we're doing each shift. So let's do our first. The u t minus 2 affects everything. And let's see, t minus 2 shows up. Where else does t show up? Oh, nice. t minus 2, t minus 2, t minus 2, t minus 2. Everything is in sync. Everything only officially starts at time 2, so we don't have to adjust for anything. The origin has been shifted to 2, so how do we convert that is just e to the minus a s of the original function. So this is just e to the minus 2 s of the Laplace transform of the original function. What is the original function? All of your t minus 2s are back to t. e to the minus t cosine t minus e to the minus t sine t. Okay. This is the undoing of your second shifting theorem, right? You're starting with converting your t minus 2 to your exponential, and wherever there's a t minus 2, it moves back to t. Now, let's be careful. Let's now convert each of the terms in this expression. When there is an exponential multiplied by f, I figure out what cosine and sine become first, and then shift your s by your coefficient c or your, your constant c in this case your constant is minus negative one so it's plus one okay so let's be careful here this is going to be e to the minus 2s the laplace of cosine t minus sine t because i factored out the e to the minus t but because of that e to the minus t i need to send my s to s plus one after i've evaluated it so let's be careful. This first step is from the second shifting theorem. This second step is from the first shifting theorem. 2st for first shifting theorem. Okay, so convert. e to the minus 2s. Cosine t is just s over s squared plus 1. So I'm going to replace the s with the s plus 1. So s plus 1 over s plus one squared plus one minus sine t is one over s squared plus one, one over s plus one squared plus one. So this is, we have to be very careful here, okay? Um, are there any questions before I continue? Uh, so let's just simplify this. Let's combine everything. This is just going to be equal to s e to the minus 2s all over s squared plus 2s plus 2. And that's li. Oh, that's great. We have an expression for li here. We have an expression for li here. All we now need to do is compare coefficients. Okay. So our last step for this problem, we compare the Li we obtained from the differential equation with the Li we obtained from the given solution. So from the differential equation, that's the Li we obtained from the solution. The Li we obtained is all already over here. Li is equal to s e to the minus 2s all over um, s times 2 plus s squared times 1 plus 2.
So what are the conclusions we can draw? The magnitude of the voltage that was given has to be one. Indeed, R is also two. Oh, sorry. All right, maybe we should start with R because that's a given. Since R is two, the magnitude of the voltage has to be one. And then we can find L and C. L is just one as well, the coefficient of S squared. And C is one over one half, sorry, one over two, that's one half. Okay. So be very careful here. Um, the big, the big new thing here is now we can do a combo of the first shifting and the second shifting theorem. If you have a unit step times an exponential, that just means do the second shifting theorem first, account for all of the shifts with the origin moved appropriately. After you've done the second shifting theorem, account for your exponentials, but you only do the shift in S afterwards, right? So by the second shifting theorem, let's put this here, the shift all happened in T here before the Laplace transform was taken. After the first shifting theorem, the shift only happened in S. And we can just compare. So one way of working, uh, using the Laplace transform is if you already know the solution, but you don't know some unknown constants, you can determine your unknown parameters by um, finding your solutions Laplace transform and finding what it should look like using the differential equation. Awesome. Okay. Um, and the next slide is already partial. Uh, are there any questions for today's talk? Not a lot of problems for today, actually, just a few problems, but some of them require a bit more thought and a bit more care. So that's the tricky thing with the Laplace transform week. Um, oh, the Laplace worksheet is the one that I gave out last week, the, the optional homework. That's already your worksheet for this week. Okay. Um, also, if you go to the textbook that I recommend, recommended, go to chapter six of the textbook or just download chapter six. Chapter six, and you skip all the way to um, the problems. There are like, how many problems? There are a lot. There are like 60 over problems that you can work on that are just saying, oh, okay, for the first 15 problems, find the Laplace transform. For the next 15 problems, find the inverse Laplace transform and the final answers are there as well. So um, do, do check that out. Um, maybe just do problems 154. Um, problem 55 onwards are stuff that you don't need to know how to do. So just problems 1 to 54. Some of them are too hard also. So if, if it looks like it's too hard, then you can always ask me, is this something I need to know how to do? Um, so it's probably yes. Okay. All right, guys, so I'm gonna hang back for a bit, but that's it for today's tutorial. Quite a short tutorial in terms of the number of problems we did, but um, it's a little bit trickier in the calculus, in the um, algebra actually, and in the concepts. So 